second WASH webinar. Thank you very much for joining. And for those of you who can't join us, you'll be able to listen again and hope you'll be also enjoying it as much as we are. For this session, we're looking now at WASH markets for humanitarian programming. And we have here our eminent speakers. Uh, Jenny Lam is going to start off, who has extensive experience in this area. And we'll also be joined by Raisa and Jonathan, who have also applied this in the field or in the process of learning with countries of how to roll these things out. Uh, so without further ado, we will crack on with the session. OK, thank you very much. And over to Jenny. OK, hi there, everyone. OK, pleasure to be here. OK, so just, let me, just moving on quickly, um, post this introductions, is the objective of today is really to give a bit of an overview of why markets should play an integral component of our WASH programming and what that entails. So what are the nuts and bolts for that? Also to provide some examples of market-based programming and then also to give a bit of an overview of initiatives that Oxfam have ongoing, which Rice, that and Jonathan will give a bit of an overview uh, for. OK, so maybe just take a step back. So, I mean, we kind of know this. I don't want to preach it too much to you, but our conventional emergency responses routinely, you know, have we may very much revolved around in-kind distribution, yeah? So your wash commodities, so your provision of free services such as tanker water, hygiene kits. There has been a tendency that we have, you know, low-level engagement with the formal and informal market actors that already exist. Um, you know, depending on the context, we can often have little involvement from government agencies. And you know, you know, as a responder, as RITs, as you know, national staff, you know, we're there to provide humanitarian response, but also not often, you know, on day one to provide those sustained uh, services. Then, in terms of like, we do exacerbate, you know, by maybe doing water trucking with dependencies on the external assistance, say from the NGOs and so forth. So, like in the water trucking market, we often um, can, you know, create that parallel dynamic there. Um, also, as well, the conventional emergency response does undermine market rehabilitation and economic re recovery, which then, then presents challenges for, for, uh, for the exit strategy and the sort of longer term durable solutions. Um, so, in terms of, I just thought we'd give you a bit of an update of you know, where we're at you know, in terms of market based pr programming. So, day to day, we all go to the market. Yeah? We go and buy our um, pint of milk or we go and buy our bread. Yeah? So, at times of crisis, we want to be able to continue with that market environment. So really, you know, we should be having an ambition more often, more often as WASH practitioners is to have that market lens in our response. So both, you know, endorsing the technical capacity to do so, but also the management buy-in to do so. Now, there is a dilemma that we face. We can't just give them cash, can we? For, you know, for a WASH outcome, they'll use it for something else. So that has been a dilemma. And that's been the sort of quandary we've faced as, as practitioners. However, what are we doing about it? Well, we have a number of WASH um, practitioners, leading with other humanitarian ones, so nutrition, shelter, health, um, food security, livelihoods, looking at ways in which we can, you know, have the cash and market agenda meet all objectives. Yeah. So UNHCR is one pilot project that's doing that, and it's doing it through a minimum expenditure basket scenario. Also, as well, you know, measuring the outcomes. You know, is really the market-based program, the creme de la creme, you know, should you know, how do we measure it differently? You know, how do we know it's got that tangible impact that is that difference for the conventional in-kind mentality? So rather more me, we as WASH practitioners should be adept in our response and capacity in looking at the wider picture. So we'll be looking more at livelihood-based outcomes with the whole market-based programming. Also as well, how can we assure quality and quantity complies with the minimum requirements in WASH? Well, there is the ways we can do that. So it's just simply just a different modality of us working. So it's Maybe looking at us doing capacity building initiatives, the enabling environment is the key thing here. So, so it's just looking at the different modalities of doing that such work. Also, as well, how do we balance the reality to the policies, so the informal actors with the municipal public system? So, for instance, one example, Lebanon, we had a quandary there in that you know there was a massive illegal water trucking market, yet there was also a municipal water system which was not trusted. So, you know, how do we? break a, an even keel with, you know, supporting either or, or one or the other. Also, as well, you know, combinations lend well. So if you've got a different, you know, in the different pillars of WASH, you know, we can have different modalities of response with market-based uh, programs. So it could be, you know, commodity voucher for, say, sanitation or shelter building materials. It could be cash for labor to utilize that voucher. And then the enabling environment around the IEC, the community awareness session. So having a, a broader perspective there. 
Then more importantly is the, um, the real-time monitoring of the market. So us having that phased approach, so it's not just, oh, we can't do work through markets on day one. It's, it's checking and balancing that market-based approach as a continuum in the cycle of emergency crisis. So looking at you know, how the market sustains itself and gets back on the even keel, but then also how we can really switch those modalities as we proceed with the response. Okay, moving on. So here really, I mean, this is really what we want to be doing more of, yeah? So strengthen the development of the humanitarian response continuum. So, you know, looking at within the market-based analysis and response at the preparedness, the emergency response, you know, the rehabilitation, the building resilience. So this whole sort of six-cycle approach. So looking at sh shocks, you know, in a preparedness fashion, but also in the response to an emergency and also more the long-term programming as well. Okay, so just I want to run through quickly the rationale for market-based responses. So I'm not going to read through these bullet points, but basically it's about efficiencies, effectiveness, market rehabilitation, um, you know, economic recovery post-crisis, and also more importantly, working with a broader range of stakeholders. Yeah? So the government, you know, creating that greater coordination and continuity pre and post-emergency. So what, why should we carry a market analysis? Well. Basically, we want to have more response analysis based on markets, which will help us enable us that choice yeah, between different modalities. So it could be cash, it could be in-kind, it could be um, voucher, it could be indirect, direct market support. And it also allows um, target groups to access basic needs and services, yeah, so creating the purchasing power, the availability, and so forth. And also, more importantly, it has that indirect action, so complements to the markets and has the multiplier effects but also helping markets to cover and reach people's needs. So um, then on the next slide, in terms of, in a way, you know, in terms of we need to endorse our managers or technical people, why we should be doing more um, abreast with market analysis is, well, it, you know, it creates higher cost efficiency. Um, you know, people's preferences and market capabilities, you know, has better effectiveness and impact there. Also as well, um, reduce of risk of you know doing harm to the market system. So basically you're building within the market conditions and building in with the livelihoods and access to market opportunities there. And also the connectedness as well. So linking with the economic recovery, linking with livelihoods and, and the sort of social norms and policies of the government and the private sector and so forth. Um, so in terms of okay we talk about why but then maybe the how. So we need to understand how markets function by collecting information. So really, as wash practitioners, we should be doing these more more holistically and strategically in assessments yeah? uh, on day one. So it can be in a phased manner on day one, but also maybe a couple of weeks after emergency evolves, maybe a few months after. But looking at these key, key simple items, such as prices, the volumes, the stock levels, the lead times, the storage, storage capabilities, <coughs> the transport, um, the number of actors, um, the access to credit and access to funds. And we can, you know, we can, essentially we can measure this by understanding the market performance. So looking at the supply and demand, so the supply from the, the market actor, the demand from the household, how that is integrated as a market function, where the power lies between those market actors, and also understanding the system and the context moreover, yeah? Okay, so Basically, understanding this, you know, the trajectory, nuts and bolts, can lead to the better responses, yeah? But to do this, you know, it needs a sort of encompassing approach to doing this. So working with the security livelihoods team, the finance team, um, the logistics team, and, and, you know, WASH as a team, both the hygiene promoters and the engineers. Okay, so maybe just a simple term, you know, mar what is a market system? So a market system is a network of producers, suppliers, processors, traders, buyers, and consumers, yeah? So basically, they're all there producing, exchanging, consuming all a particular service or an item. So in the wash sector, that could be either water trucking, it could be the sludging services, it could be provision of consumable items such as soap and sanitary towels and so forth. And we look at a critical market. So a critical market that we'd look at maybe, for instance, in an emergency, say, in Nepal or in Yemen would be, say, a water market, for instance. So I'm just going to flip through here. So for instance here, so the market system here, this is what we need to do, is we need to examine three layers. So basically we're looking at the market chain, 
so where does the water essentially come from and who else is concerned with it? So what stakeholders involved and basically looking at the consumer to the actual producer. And then we look at also the, the infrastructure, the services, the inputs. So what, what, what inputs are needed to operate that effectively and efficiently? And then in and around that sector, we need to understand, okay, what governs and rules that and what trends, you know, govern that water supply. Um, in terms of market-based programming, so maybe let's contextualise this in sort of emergency interventions and the preparedness scenario. So what, what does this mean to us as a wash you know, sector and professionals? Well, when you think about market integrated relief, what does it mean? Well, it's providing basically support through the market. Yeah? So it could, what, what does it look like? Well, that could be um, direct cash and it could be commodity vouchers. So a commodity voucher being for, say, a consumable hygiene kit. It could be a value voucher, so that would be for a value of money, so say $50, and you could get a list of prescribed and be hygiene items that you can then use that to redeem uh, the voucher with. Then also it could be, you know, as we do, our in-kind delivery with, with the local procurement. Then there's the indirect um, support to the market, where it's where we actually want to, more importantly, rehabilitate and strengthen the market system to supply that relief. So it would be working with traders, suppliers, actors, and so forth. And that could be tangible. We could actually have physical activities to do that. So it could be, you know, grants or loans or subsidies, you know, in terms of maybe providing temporary storage for traders. Also, it could be, you know, endorsing better quality assurance, capacity building, all, all told really to support that supply and demand. Then on the preparedness side of things, you know, we could be looking at, you know, how we strengthen the market, you know, pre-shock, you know, in the case of a crisis. So, looking at the scenarios, looking at the financial services, looking at maybe enterprise development and so forth. Okay. Okay, so I just want to give you a heads up on where we've done some of this market-based analysis. So some of you might have met or seen a lady called Emma. So it's actually a tool. It's called the Emergency Market Mapping Analysis Toolkit. So, I mean, some people have seen this as a very much food security tool, but it's not. It can be applied to any market system, which the WASH team have done so over the last few years, which is a great, great capacity development. So, over the years we've done this, um, analysing the market system in Zatry, um, in, sorry, Zarka in, in Jordan, also in, in response to the drought in Harshim in Ethiopia. Then we had some assessments done with uh, the supply of water and also the water treatment mechanisms in Uvira and DRC. And then related to that in DRC in a different area in Bukavu, we also did sanitation materials and labour. Then also some work on in Gaza and also in a recent uh, natural disaster in the Philippines it was um, on the hygiene market system. Okay, so what, what does this really help us do and you know think differently. Well, here, here's an example. Here's some photos here of the Bekaa Valley in the Lebanon. Um, so this is uh, responding to the Syrian refugee crisis, uh, and a lot of those Syrians are living in informal tented settlements here. So you'll see the photos there in the top to represent as the water environment. So from springs to um, the water trucking hydrants to um, bottling stations, and then the, the the photo on the left is the water truck drivers, and then on the right is the um, informal tent of settlement. So you'll see the storage tanks that they have there at the household level. Can you go to the next slide? Sorry. Okay, so okay, what does this um, lend us to do and think differently? Well, on the the Emma, in terms of this tool, helped us unravel a bit more perspective of the situation in the Bekaa Valley. So what we find at the macro level, the water supply was the issue. Yeah? So it wasn't necessarily demand. Um, so basically it was inadequate water available and the intermittent electricity and the poor winter was, was the sort of clear issues for them. Then on the meso micro level, more the community level, the demand was an issue because they lacked the purchasing power, the storage and also the linkages uh, to the market actors. So what did we do differently that the EMA brought us for this tool of, of looking more closely at the market? Well, we did water vouchers, linking up with the, with the market actors of the water truckers. Then we did also the in-kind distribution of uh, water tanks. And also we did an you know, extension of the municipal water system. So it was twofold, it was the sort of public and the private sector. And also we did the quality checks and quality assurance of the truckers and the bottling stations. But this EMA sort of process did allow us to look at other 
other ways in, in delivering wash. We also did the hygiene kits and emptying of latrines through vouchers. Okay, I'm going to switch over to Gaza. So uniquely, because we've done a lot of preparatory work, the more in the preparedness measure. So when you look at the team in Gaza, very much a national-based team, we did a tremendous amount of work by mapping all the um, borehole operators, all the reverse osmosis operators. They knew the expandability of the workshop. They knew the expandability of the actual yield of the boreholes. And you know they had this sort of voucher-based system um, pre-crisis of the Operation Protection Edge, which occurred in July last year. So basically, because we had a good analysis of the market, we were able to reach 30% you know, of Gaza's entire population in that crisis. And we used Oxfam net 60% of the drinking water needs. So a lot of the actors were really coming to us you know, and, and really echoing that you know, our reputation was known wide, you know, one of the biggest factors. And this was us being doing very comprehensive preparatory work, um, looking at the market pre-crisis. So you know, congratulations to the team on that. Then more importantly, I want to showcase as well some of the initiatives where it's not required an EMA. It doesn't always require this robust tool to actually look at the market actors. So uniquely, fair play to the team in Kenya and Cambodia, they really looked at opportunities <laughs> looked at social enterprise models. So here on the left on the photos there you'll see in Kenya, the team there worked with Sanaji uh, on bringing forth these fresh uh, life toilets in both uh, Nairobi slums and in the schools. And there's a social enterprise model here where there's paid collectors that come and collect the urine uh, and feces separated, taken off site, it's then composted and then used um, for um, compost for growing the flowers. So that, that sort of closing the loop service model has worked well with, with the market actors there. And then the pictures on the right has worked, you know, with some women's groups there in Cambodia looking at how they basically, you know, set up an enterprise uh, treating and bottling water there. So again, looking at, at the context there and what's possible. These just, again, illustrate some pictures of where we've been doing the voucher-based programming for the top Top ones are of Jordan, so vouchers for bottling stations, but also the tankered water. The middle ones are in DRC and in uh, Haiti, where we did vouchers both through boutiques, linking up with traders, but also through a fair system. And then obviously the Cambodia pictures in the bottom too. Okay, so maybe just in summary for me, I think our ambition is that you know the wash assessment should be always equipped with a market lens, you know, in all our assessments. And that we shouldn't be daunted by the array of tools yeah? um, that are out there. They can and should be multidisciplinary. The key thing being is, is the integration and coordination across all the different sectors within Oxfam. So we need to really be abreast of what's needed. You know, the MOUs, looking at stock levels, looking at the risk, the quality assurance, and so forth. And also not forgetting that you know, in terms of the combination of lend well, yeah, it's about the enabling environment and looking at different pillars of the response. So it's really just looking at different modality choices. So maybe it is a a commodity voucher plus cash plus you know the awareness raising sessions, and also as well we need to catch up as as an organisation with the sector discussions that are happening about the multi expenditure basket discussions. So looking at the needs across shelter, wash, ESL, um, protection, you know, uh, health outcomes, you know, how we could um, really you know provide maybe a cash basket that accommodates all of that, for instance. And also the monitoring framework that's going to be required there, um, you know, to really tangibly measure the impact differently, and then helps us inform the switch between modalities as as the phase of the response moves on. Okay, so more importantly now, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to hand over to both um, Jonathan and Raisa, who are going to give you a bit of an overview. Okay, well, what next? What are we doing as an organisation as Oxfam? So both of them will give you a bit of an insight of that because. We have kind of explored some of the good things we're doing, but also some of the dilemmas that we need to address as, as an organization. Thanks, Jenny. So um, obviously what you have been uh, presenting is also very important um, in terms of what does that mean for PHP. So we have been looking at um, actually where we are in the PHP and cash and market analysis and CPPs. So um, we have to keep in mind so how we respond in the best and most appropriate way to beneficiary needs. And therefore, we wanted to explore and define how Oxfam is internally uh, positioning itself on the CTP and market analysis in PHP. 
So we decided to do a scopic uh, study. So at the moment, we have a consultant who actually is working on it. So I'm not going to present any big um, results from it, but maybe just highlighting a few things that are coming. And hopefully, by the end of September, we should have um, uh, the report. And we'll definitely be sharing that and also ask for comments on this, because obviously, um, lots of people around the table um, and outside, out there in the world, um, have also a lot of experience on it and probably we can input on it. So basically, we were looking at a desk review, uh, and we were looking at uh, the the perception of different practitioners. So had been interviewed in Oxfam, outside of Oxfam, trying to gather as much as possible information, um, trying to understand um, what they understand by market and um, cash transfer programming in the PHP um, programming. Uh, what are the enables and success factors? What are the barriers and challenges in the use of the market? And trying to have them to share the experience and their lesson learned. So, primary findings. Well, actually, <laughs> um, Sophie has come up with a, a very good table. She is trying to to um, to capture a different um, lesson learned and different examples. So, some in Haiti, Jordan, Gaza, uh, DRC, and Philippines. Um, so, what happens in the world of the PHP is that most of the experience is around NFIs. Sometimes it is NFIs and um, school fees, um, so paying for school fees. Or well, sometimes it's NFIs and also linked to food. But most of the time it's about NFIs, even though that we heard that some in some countries maybe we have um, hygiene promotion training and kind of like voucher or cash for hygiene promotion training. Uh, we're not very much in favor of that, and that's why we also wanted to explore that if it's actually happening. And we, we we're thinking more of if you do PHP training, well, we we kind of touch something around the change of behavior, and then therefore paying people to come to a session, and we we're not really sure about the impact it has actually on on behavior change. So anyway, um, what we find out for the moment um, is that there's not really any direct cash distribution for PHP objectives. Um, some positive points were around security, not gathering big groups of people. Some points were around dignity, providing option to people, empowering beneficiary to be able to come at the time they wanted to go to the, to the shop and getting more or less a, a wider range of, of choices. It's less heavy on logistics, transport, um, uh, storage. Um, it appears that it's easier when the uh, market analysis has been done before, like in Haiti and Jordan. Um, these are definitely when you have experienced staff on the ground. Um, and maybe definitely uh, looking at uh, beyond the public health objective, as Jenny also explained, um, looking at the opportunity of to support um, local markets. So basically, some of the uh, problems, obviously, that the practitioner highlighted was the lack of experience of staff, so that's therefore the needs of tools and training, uh, and if possible, things done in preparedness that will really help. Um, voucher um, vouchers are really time-consuming exercise, so especially if the, the people are not aware of it, so staff, beneficiary, traders. Um, commodity voucher were quite more restrictive than cash voucher, but at the same time, cash voucher implies some more risks. Um, voucher could be appreciated by specific groups, like for women in some countries. Um, so there is also risk of beneficiary buying um, stuff at a higher price, like especially in fair using um, vouchers. Um, definitely, there will be there will be a need of the PHP team also to um, to do some appropriate sensitization around uh, around all this, the setup of the cash transfer programming. Um, there were some positive points about having fair in rural area where you actually brought the vendors. Towards uh, closer to the, the, the beneficiaries, um, and definitely something that came out. It was really crucial that all the staff support was involved. The multi-sector, like Washington EFSL, S, EFSVL, of the shelter uh, collaboration, was very important. Um, questions around our trade is also beneficiaries. Um, and finally, but most of all, we, we found out actually there's not much out there. So we were thinking, your know, Oxfam is not doing much, but actually out there, there's not much on specifically PHP. 
So uh, definitely, uh, we we we're looking at a uh, lack of monitoring, a lack of documentation of whatever experience has been done, because they're probably be having more experience around the world, but they have not been really well documented and monitored. So therefore, it was very difficult to to do any conclusion from it. Thank you very much, uh, Raisa. Um, Jonathan speaking now. Um, so I'm just going to briefly give you an introduction to the program of activity related to this, um, which is just getting underway. Um, this is funded by OFTA and the USAID. Um, so the title of this um, program of activity is Promoting Market-Based Responses to Emergencies through wash market mapping and, uh, and analysis. Um, so I think we, we essentially we recognize that a market-based programming approach is the way forward. Um, and, we, and using market mapping and analysis tools can help us um, progress. Um, but we also recognize that we're really very much um, at early stage in this process. So part of the reason why we wanted to convene this webinar um, was really as a, a starting point for uh, ourselves and our colleagues um, on this journey so that um, over the next 18 months um, we can really um, strengthen our own capacities <coughs> and, our, and the partners that we're working with in country um, to really adopt this approach more systematically. The project has five components um, and you'll see that we're focusing on four countries, uh, namely Bangladesh, Haiti, Indonesia and Zimbabwe. Uh, and I know we have a few colleagues from those countries online, so I'd be keen to hear from them shortly. Um, at the moment, as I say, we've just, we're just getting underway. Uh, our first activity is really to review and consolidate what we know to look at experiences in using EMAs and PCMMAs um, and to prepare some materials um, which are WASH particularly orientated for people like ourselves who are working in the WASH sector um, so that we can use those tools um, for, for and engage with people who are working in the WASH sector. Um, component three is essentially using pre-crisis market mapping and analysis um, to support government agencies and private sector to strengthen emergency preparedness and resilience. Four is about uh, uh, essentially EMMA, so emergency market mapping and analysis in two disaster situations. Uh, we don't know where those disaster situations will be, as you, I'm sure you will understand. And the fifth one is about a wider uh, promotion and uptake of the approach, both with it at national level within those four countries and also internationally working with other agencies to promote the approach. Um, I'm not going to go into this in great detail, but the sorts of activities that we envisage um, taking place in the four countries, really focusing around engagement with different stakeholder groups. Uh, one of those groups being people like ourselves, so humanitarian actors, uh, both INGOs and our partner national NGOs, um, WASH cluster um, practitioners. Um, another target group will be government agencies, local authorities, um, supporting them to develop local area-based emergency preparedness and contingency plans, which are um, developed using market mapping and analysis. Private sector, obviously key actors, I think that's, that's clear. Um, and then we want to bring different actors together to be looking at um, scenario-based learning activities, um, simulation activities, so essentially workshops that utilize scenario-based learning as the approach, um, and then policy forums for national international agencies. Um, essentially, I think, I think this, we've been through this, um, we're supporting governments local authorities prefer disaster preparedness plans. We want to help private sector actors with business continuity planning. We want to look at supporting cash-based responses to support market-based responses. 
um, prioritization of emergency preparedness plans according to household economy and vulnerability assessments. And, and key to this is really establishing better communication and lines of accountability between civil society, private sector and government. So that's just an overview of the OFTA activities which we're just commencing. Thanks. Okay, so can I, I'm really sorry just to summarize. There's a couple of um, good uh, tools here as well in terms of websites here. So this page here just illustrates so Oxfam does have a standard operating uh, procedures guidance note on, on working with uh, cash and markets, the top left hand corner. And then also there's obviously the EMMA toolkit and then also CALP has an inordinate amount of tools and case studies on their website too as well, one day market analysis and emergencies and they've got lots of others. And then also um, an Oxfam and an IRC um, project there and the pre-crisis mapping and analysis, there's a step-by-step -step guidance note there. So this, these are the websites that um, you all had sent out earlier too as well. So these are good tools for a bit of background reading. Okay, thanks very much Jenny, Rice and Jonathan. Um, I think that's given us a really comprehensive overview of what the situation is, what the possibilities uh, also are in the future to go forward and we look forward to watching that space as more documents and information comes out. Now is the opportunity for those of you on the, the call to ask uh, the panelists any questions that you may have. Um, do we have any questions from the people online? Okay, uh, Eva, do you want to ask a question, Jack, after we'll line you up? Hello, everyone. Um, my question is a little bit of a tricky one. Uh, we have been talking a lot about uh, measuring public health outcomes and uh, to which extent that is possible, and I would be keen to understand more about um, what, what the current ideas are and what current approaches um, to it is. Okay, um, Eva, yeah, I think that is a clear gap that we need to address. So we're hoping with even the unraveling and appreciating more under the OFTA project, we'll be able to um, articulate that better. But also I think not just looking at the WASH outcomes, I think we need to be looking more as a WASH team at, at the bigger picture as well. So looking at the maybe livelihood outcomes as well as sustainable outcomes too as well. So, and also ask ourselves are we creating a mountain out of a molehill too as well? Like, you know, in a way it's a different modality choice. So do we measure the same way or do we measure a little bit differently? So I think we need to do a bit of check and balances and do a bit of trials with, with the different scenarios and different measurable um, ways of doing things in terms of outcome monitoring and so forth. Um, thank you for your question, Eva. Um, it's a very pertinent question um, and we are expected to be looking at the effectiveness of a market-based approach under the off the program. Um, the key issue that comes to my mind that I think we need to explore more here is if we consider, for example, a, a bar of soap and, and we're looking at a conventional humanitarian response in, and compare that with what we're referring to here as a, a market-based response, are we needing to look at the effectiveness of people using that bar of soap to wash their hands in terms of public health outcomes or in this context are we in fact really being asked to look at the modalities of the um, distribution. In effect, if we assume that the person using the, the soap, um, the result is we kind of assume um, well, this is a question I have in my mind, is do we assume that the use of the soap is going to be the same and therefore in this context perhaps the question is not in terms of public health outcomes but in terms of the kind of the efficiency and effectiveness of the distribution. I don't have a clear answer but that's a question that we need to be thinking about. Okay. Thanks, Jonathan and Jenny. Um, in the meantime, we've had also another question come in for the purpose of those people who are going to be listening.
listening to this again, uh, can you read out the question and then provide the answer? And I'd like to tag on to the end of that question is how do we do post distribution monitoring in these instances? Because these are very different types of ways of working and activities. Uh, and how do we go about it, particularly with the cash and, non and uh, unconditional grants as well? Okay, thank you. Um, so I'm reading the question of Steph. Uh, she's asking me if I'm, if I think PHP team could ever give unconditional cash for hygiene items, or would it be, or would it need to be voucher to ensure that they're actually really buying soap or any other, any other item, um, or would monitoring uh, what people actually are buying is is good enough? But I do not have the answer, or at least I have my own answer, but I think um, what we're trying to do with the uh, scoping study is try to gather more information, try to understand it more in terms of what has been the experience of it before we actually say, yes, we should be doing it, or no, we should not be doing it. And I will go back to what Jenny explained, and I think it's about understanding the context, understanding that maybe we're not just alone on, on that, so maybe understanding the needs better, and maybe Maybe there's need of phasing things, so maybe we could do in-kind in first and then after that using voucher or cash, or maybe we could do purple, uh, multi-purpose um, cash. ISA will say, yes, let's be courageous, but Oxfam needs to, um, to really look at it and then try to explore a bit more. And try, yeah, try to try things out, basically, but again, monitoring it properly, because otherwise we'll never learn from it. Okay, thanks, Raisa. I mean, to all the panelists, um, in terms of monitoring, normally after we do a bulk distribution in a traditional setting, we do then monitoring afterwards in the traditional way. But in this aspect where people can buy as and when they wish, what are the optimum times that we should be monitoring? Should it be sort of on a set time frame? So after a week or a month of doing the actual giving the voucher or the distribution, so there's not necessarily a clear end date like we would normally do in an NFI distribution. We you know when your last package has been distributed and then a set time after that you monitor. In this case, because people have the option of buying or choosing what they want when they want, when is the optimum time to do such kind of uh, monitoring systems? Hmm. A tricky one. I mean, I think if it was a commodity voucher, then that'd be normally you give an actual set time limit when that should be redeemed by. So then you could then build your monitoring on it thereafter. So, so say if you give, say, 10 days window to redeem that voucher, then you maybe go monitor maybe two weeks after that window's closed. On the open cash agenda, I think we've been talking about cash unconditional for wash for a long, long time now. I think we just have to like go out by the horns and just give it a go sometimes. You know, we talk a lot about it, but until we provide the enabling environment and look at the more multi sector needs and give it a try maybe on a small scale, then we'll never know. And also as well, it's about having that relationship with the beneficiaries and understanding the context, the policies of the government what you know, existing social protection systems they might have in place as well. You know, so building on that, you know, not having any parallel things. So I think as well what was interesting, there was a an M PESA no, it was a sort of cash um presentation by the Philippines team just a few weeks ago. And they actually illustrated that the cash, the unconditional cash was used for shelter and food post high arm, but then they were seen as the cash was being dispersed, like it then switched to hygiene and sanitation. So that trajectory of need, so then that maybe needs to look at us being a bit different with our phasing of the response, the phasing of the modality. So maybe we do in kind of initially, but then we do switch to cash if we've got the enabling environment and their needs have neutralized a bit, you know? So anyway, that's just some thoughts. Okay, I know there is no right answer at this stage and it's so dependent on the situation, scenario, crisis and whatever else. So um, yeah, I'm sorry to put people on the spot to ask, but yeah, appreciate that uh, it's not going to be one size fits all. Um, we had, uh, Jack was mentioning on the chat room about doing more digital monitoring for post distribution uh, with online platforms. Um, especially for those using digital vouchers. Uh, well, yes, absolutely. And uh, Jack, if you want to add to that, uh, by all means, um, raise your hand and we'll invite you on to the, the call bit. Uh, otherwise, Hillman, you mentioned that by far the hygiene kit was still to be the most effective use uh, commodity voucher as the nature is different um, and not as crucial as water. If you want to elaborate on that, then 
by all means raise your hand and we'll call you in. Um, otherwise, uh, Nega, did you have a question? Okay, uh, my question is it's not kind of question, but uh, asking clarification probably from Jonathan. We're talking a lot about private sector actors. And it's good that private sector is involved in the WASH provision long term or emergency programming, but the profiteering bit is something that we need to be very careful around. So how do we manage or how do we tackle? Because there is a quality issue. If, for example, it's hygiene kits distribution, they want to make profit as much as possible so they can give you also all kinds of soaps, for example, buckets. So what what are we planning to do in terms of controlling the private sector vis-a-vis -vis profiteering? Thank you, Nia. Uh, very much a uh, yeah, key issue that we need to be looking at. Um, if we truly kind of embrace a market-based approach, I mean, the government actors need to be playing a key role, in, and really it's, it's very much around strengthening the existing market mechanisms of accountability. Um, and if we, put, if we empower the, the, those who need the help with cash, and vouchers, then in a way they are the ones that will drive the the market forces, and therefore, I mean, what it boils down to, I guess it boils down to monopoly, because if you've got a situation where you've only got one, then they can really control, and that's going to be difficult. But but if there are more market actors, then I I guess it will be easier. In any situation, it's going to be it's there are going to be complexities. Um, over to Jenny, who's going to probably. Absolutely. Yeah, no, just to add on maybe some practical examples from the field. So I think in Gaza and in Haiti, so it really had to draw back the logistics team supporting the wash team in more detail to really work with the traders and understanding them, okay, pre-crisis, what was your profit margins, what were your prices, what were your stock levels, and then coming with sort our of middle ground in terms of, okay, let's not optimize this sort of crisis, let's look at what's realistic in terms of quality but also price. So like I remember like in Haiti we did have you know extensive analysis of the the boutiques that are providing the hygiene kits. So looking at the quality, we had to go back and forth a little bit on, on what our quality derivative was there. So in a way it has a good sort of multiplying effect in terms of feature that you know this is our customer and if you know this is a quality that we should be standing for. So so that was examples there. Um and I think yeah, I mean, the private sector are responding often quicker than us sometimes now, you know, in some emergencies. So they need to be an ally and a partnership um, stakeholder, definitely. Yes, I can definitely add to that. I think that's why I was mentioning that um, the voucher system is also very heavy because you have to, uh, you definitely have to um, look at the different traders and their capacity, but also having the, the quality issues on the on the items they're selling, and that's really time consuming. Um, and if you're using um, commodity voucher and cash voucher, then you have other layers of other complexity as well because if people are kind of uh, able to choose things outside of a list, then you also have some risk in terms of um, people buying things that are not legal or not supposed to be buying, and they have some um, agreement with the trader. So there's a lot of um, issues around risk and around quality and around all the work that needs to be done. So voucher, in a way, even though it's easier for um, certain parts of logistics because you don't have to ship uh, the, the buckets and the soap, you don't have to store it, you don't have to transport it, that part is is it's less heavy in a voucher, but there's another part that actually the logistic team needs to be involved, and it's really around traders, it's really around quality, it's really around capacity, and that's a big, big, um, uh, important work. So sometimes we we only think that voucher, and I agree when human says, well, community community voucher, I think it's something we use more for NFI, but I think we should explore other things. And, and cash is one thing that comes as well. I think we, there we need to really go beyond our limits, maybe and exploit, but in a in a kind of way, um, kind of a, yeah, organized way of of doing things. Point, uh, yeah, Danny. 
um, I'm thinking in terms of bringing in controlling mechanism whereby you control the quality of whatever the private sector is bringing. I can give you an example. For example, in Gaza, when we were doing water, uh, water, water for water, we empowered the community by giving them a kit so that they check the chlorine level in whatever water they are collecting. That was a good example. The community, they collect their water, but they check the chlorine level and they say good or not good. That can be transferred and that, that kind of controlling mechanism for other things when we bring in private sector is something that I'm thinking. So this is a good example, but what else? What can we do for hand pumps, for example? The private sector can sell hand pumps. The community have to come. What sort of controlling mechanism? What type of hand pump? How good? How robust? These are the kind of things I'm thinking. Yeah, I think that, that there's so many questions around this that we still haven't quite fine-tuned, but I think a lot of the answers also come from the communities themselves, and so they know their markets, they know their surroundings, and they know the key players and the monopolizers amongst them, um, and perhaps that's also something that needs to be really robustly analyzed before going into this as part of the assessment stage. Um, I, I have a question as to how at the Oxfam way of working and doing these kinds of assessments and helping align the markets with the costs and the quality of the goods, that's fine for us and how we work. But then if, say, if we have established a certain cost or a price or a quality in a system with a supplier and a community, but there are also other agencies working in that area. So how can we, can we influence uh, how other actors work because those suppliers may be providing a different cost, a different quality through other agencies, but again to the same community. Have you come across that kind of issue and is that something that we can help work with, uh, uh, align with better and um, yeah, any suggestions from your side? I think that I'm coordination. I think, I mean, the Lebanon and three, another example, which I've repeated before, is, you know, there we looked at the scenario and the market you know, across agencies, there's World Vision, Oxfam, Intersos, and SAWA. So it was a collaborative approach looking at the Deca Valley, what opportunities lie there. So I think doing more um, of the analysis together, joined up rather than being siloed as Oxfam. Um, but also, yeah, I mean, there is the reality is, you know, say if we, I don't know, provided cash for various needs, and then we find, you know, another agency next door is doing in kind, you know. So, you know, there are these that are chicken and egg situations we will find ourselves in that we need to sort of coordinate quite effectively. Um, and also as well, the government, you know, I mean, in Nepal recently too as well, they've been doing cash injection while we've been doing in kind. So, yeah, so how, how does that work, you know? So, yeah, all these different, you know, interlocutors and, yeah, that influence what we can do, what we should do. I mean, is, um, is that something we can do as part of maybe the PC MMA is to agree with the government on modalities during crisis situations that could be set up? Um, I mean, is that a possibility? Yeah, I mean, I think the pre-crisis, the PC MMA can be a tool that can inform contingency plans. So yeah, that could be a great modality choice. Um, and then on the EMA is more about bringing all different stakeholders together, looking at the what's possible in you know day one of emergency, the month later, two months later, that sort of thing. So getting a lot of those maybe informed choices, but also informed baseline data, pre pre shock, um, especially in mind of slow onset, but more than rapid onset, maybe looking at scenarios. Yeah, maybe Jonathan Risa, you got things to add? Um, yes, I, I don't have a lot of experience, but when I, um, what I remember um, from, um, I think it was in the Ivory Coast, was definitely that uh, there was some um, coordination mechanism, and I mean, a lot were, we were discussed internally, so the FSVL and the WASH together, so that, that communication was very important, um, and then um, the FSVL actually was also into uh, some coordination in terms of um, uh, food as well, but as well around uh, distribution through uh, fairs and everything. So there was different uh, coordination mechanism, and I remember that um, having a good internal coordination was also helping um, to kind of speak in one voice and kind of say, okay, if the market is going to do that, or if people are interested in looking at the market, what are they looking at, um, even though it was 
not the wash in just in the front line, but kind of uh, with the support of our colleague, actually, it was quite good to, um, to, to make her thought through and then decide what we were going to be doing. And we were a lot involved with our WFP and, and other actors as well. So, yeah. Um, thank you for that question, Yola. Um, I mean, I would liken this to in the development sector. In the development sector, um, in one village, one agency promoting community-led total sanitation, saying absolutely no subsidies for household toilet facilities, and then the neighbouring village, um, a different agency um, building latrines for people. Um, so this is really yeah, an issue that affects the whole international development and humanitarian organizations. Um, and I guess the only way forward is to work yeah, as much as possible. I think UNICEF would be a, a key ally here to, to help coordinate uh, our actions um, and working in, you know, working closely upstream, working with government um, to get sort of consistency in our approaches upstream. But I guess upstream is is where we need to focus our attention. Thanks. Okay, thank you very much. Um, if there's no further questions from the floor, we'll be looking to wrap up. Um, but I would encourage, based on that there's such a huge amount of information and opportunities and approaches that have been talked about today, uh, that we'd like to perhaps hone in on some specifics uh, for future sessions. And we'd encourage you to write in to any of us uh, included here today to suggest what you would like uh, the next webinar to be on uh, and any specific areas that have been discussed with cash markets in general. Um, so as a closing uh, remark, I think, uh, first of all, thanks to all the panelists we've had here today and to you joining us and for all the questions that we've received. Um, particularly big thanks to people who have not been very well and have actually managed to stay throughout the process with us today. Um, final then to each of the panelists, uh, starting with Jenny, what would be your tip top tip for people listening in uh, and what would you suggest be the number one thing that they bear in mind or remember from this session? Very good question. Um, I'd say use the markets. I mean, in terms of integral to our response more often now than, I mean, we're kind of, are we in the 80s? Are we in 2015? I don't know. Um, yeah, I would say actually more conclusively looking at markets and assessments, you know, on day one, but also progressively as, as the response goes on. And, you know, if it, if it recommends not to do market-based program, that's fine. At least you've done the market assessment. So market assessments are key. Um, right, that's what I wanted to say. That's not fair. <laughs> so, <laughs> no, but I, um, I, I, I think I think when I start thinking about um, market analysis, and I was like, how on earth is this is going to help us to achieve our PHP uh, programming and our public health uh, objectives? I'm quite convinced there's a way of doing it. I think we, the, the, the road is quite long. It's going to take time. We, we started the journey. Um, I think I'd like to see more initiative from the field and how we can actually engage uh, with each other to support, to make sure that we monitor and make sure that we document and then we learn kind of like a learning uh, stage, a learning process. So yeah, just um, keep going. We'll, we'll get there. I'm quite convinced we'll get there. We'll just have a, a long journey ahead. Um, thank you. Um, so a closing remark from me, I guess, would be, I think if we don't kind of embrace a more market-based approach to our programming, um, we do, we are likely to perpetuate a situation in which um, a lot of money is spent on humanitarian interventions where it's not necessarily so required. If we're looking at this, the number of emergencies uh, and our capacity to respond to those emergencies, um, 
I think we have to face the reality that we really can't meet that demand unless we are more uh, in more working with existing markets. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. Then I think we can close off this session. Uh, but there is, I think, a lot of generated interest around it. Uh, so, yeah, please send us your comments, suggestions, more than welcome. That's good. I've got my microphone in. Uh, so I just wanted to say thank you so much for those of you who have participated. Um, and please, yes, do send us your suggestions of what can be done. Um, we will try and convene the next one based on your recommendations uh, and look forward to having you on board with us again. Thank you very much for everyone today. And that's goodbye from me.